Well, welcome everyone. Drake Barak is chair of the National Athletic Society, and we have a very special uh, NHS talks this evening. Uh, and we're very, uh, even though we're focusing on the Greek Independence Day coming up next week, 200th anniversary, uh, our focus tonight will actually be the influences behind the scenes. And not only the stories of folks that have uh, supported uh, and uh, the Phil Hellenes that were active in the, in the helping the war, Greek War of Independence, but the influence, specifically the influence here in our backyard here in Boston. And it's a pleasure for me to have with us this evening uh, Costa Sidridis, who is a, uh, also a good friend, a uh, NHS member and coach here with me here in, here in Boston area for, for, for NHS. And more importantly, uh, he is the president of the Alpha Omega Council here in Boston. And uh, Costa, welcome. Uh, Costa will, will tell us a little bit about Alpha Omega. They're our co-hosts this evening. We're glad to have them with them. I'm a long-term member as well. Uh, with Gusto. And then our uh, esteemed, hardworking, and dedicated executive director from the National Athletic Society, Art Demopoulos, who just loves everything about Boston. Um, but anyway, he, uh, he will be uh, <laughs> kicking off the event with, uh, with our dialogue tonight with our very special guest, Jared Giacovone, uh, studied at URI. Uh, he's a, still a, a resident of uh, Rhode Island as well today. Uh, he just joined a, uh, the team at the library at the New County Librarian in Tyrell County, North Carolina. He's a graduate of URI uh, where he earned his master's degrees in history uh, and in library and information studies. Uh, he served as the adjunct curator at the uh, Bristol Historical and Preservation Society, also in Rhode Island and Bristol, and a pro project archivist uh, at the Mills Public Library with a specialty in digital preservation reference uh, librarian at the Newport Library in Rhode Island as well. And his master's thesis, which we'll, we're gonna dive deep into, was, was called The Paid Vote, America's Neutrality During the Greek War for Independence. So Jared, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Our pleasure, our pleasure. All right, before we get going, why don't we have Costa just give us a little, little at least our national audience, a little bit of uh, who Alpha Omega is, as uh, as our obviously our great co-host uh, this evening, Costa. Great, thank you, uh, Art. Good to see you and Jared. Welcome. So, folks, my name is Costa Cedaritis. I have the honor and privilege to be the president of the Alpha Omega Council here, based in Boston. Uh, we started back in the middle 70s. Uh, we we're 100 people strong. We're a nonprofit philanthropic organization that cultivates the ideals of Hellenism. We do that in many different ways, uh, many different aspects, both with the marathon, with other philanthropic activities we do in, and uh, we're pretty active here in the greater Boston area. And like I said, we're uh, 100 strong, and we're continuing to do a lot of good stuff here in Zito, we've been active uh, with a lot of things going on the past couple of weeks, if not months, for the big event coming up next Thursday. So it's a privilege to be here with my good friends, Drake and Art, and uh, we are very excited to hear more about Jared's research and what more we can learn from uh, this great thing that happened uh, 200 years ago and, and beyond. So uh, that's, that's in a nutshell for me. So I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation this evening. So I, too, am very, very pleased to have our special guest and and an and honor to co-host this with Alpha Omega. A lot of good, good friends there. So the, the first and most important question is, are you still a Patriots fan, uh, Jared? Oh, you bet. And a Sox fan, too. <laughs> Brady may have left, but my heart's always with the Pats. This is my cue to leave the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I am fascinated uh, about uh, how you pick this this uh, era and epic and, and war, you know, to be sort of the centerpiece of your master's uh, uh, dissertation or, or thesis. Mm -hmm. um, we know, you know, a lot of the founding fathers were, were required to study Greek, the Greek language, um, philosophy, political science theory, Aristotle, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And so there was an, a natural affinity towards, towards uh, uh, the, the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. And I know you were very fascinated by the founding fathers. So, so how did the nexus occur, given your background in this particular subject? I, I'd love to hear that. Well, in undergraduate school, um, I studied specific, uh, I double majored in history and humanities with the minors and minor in classics. So I really loved studying about the ancient world, with ancient Greece and ancient Rome. 
And one of the classes I took uh, during that time uh, was a course on classical America, um, which talked about all of the influences that led to um, led to the era that we know, the era of revolution, and why America was so uh, classically inclined, and how that they truly saw themselves as a nation that was founded on reason and rooted deep into ancient philosophy, along with modern philosophy uh, of the time, specifically with Rousseau, uh, Montesquieu, and Locke, and other uh, philosophers of the, of the past 200 years at that time. Um, and so it, that kind of piqued my interest because it was not just, you know, how they compose themselves in everyday life. It was almost like, if I had to make an equivalence of it, to them talking about Livy and Plutarch um, is like talking about Marvel and Marvel and DC. Like everybody knew a little bit about the <laughs> about the history of the time. Even the most common person knew the uh, influences from the past, and I just kind of fascinated me that there was such a literary literary inclination to learning about the past and basing their society on Enlightenment ideals um, and kind of crafting this new nation out of it. And so when I was in graduate school, I had the opportunity to, uh, to kind of search whatever I wanted. And I said, you know, subject that, I, that seemed very interesting was America's involvement or lack of involvement in the Greek War for Independence. Um, and it just kind of went off from there. And I found that there's just so much that hadn't really been explored about the topic and just how dedicated people were to this cause. People willingly volunteered their own lives to go fight in a country they've never been in before because they felt such a cultural connection to it over time and how that, you know, fighting for them for this cause for independence that they saw not just as like their own nation in the present, but like this culture in the past that they see that they were directly descended from. So, I mean, that kind of just led the way into kind of studying this topic. It was just kind of a culmination of things. And somebody who likes the classics, it's, not, it's uh, very interesting to see how when people have a classical education, how it all kind of comes together um, in political action. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, Costa? Yeah, uh, John, one of the things that I'm most fascinated on is, is navigating through all this research, right? Because you've done a great job. It's extensive. It's impressive. Tell us about the navigating of all this research, right? There's all these ominous, like, rabbit holes that you see when you do some of this historical research. Yeah. All these different stakeholders of the era, the event, and so forth. So tell us a bit how you navigate. Like, how did you get that game plan together? How, do you, how did you give us your thought process and all that and how you put this together? Well, I, I first started off kind of small at first. I started with, you know, searching at what the federal government's history was of it. Like, this is the issue that was presented to them. They voted it down and said, and, but there was such an outpouring of support. I was sitting there and I was like, well, why did they not go for it? If there was such a backlash of people really trying to support this cause and as I looked a little bit deeper, I came across one article from, a Mike, from Michael Chapman who said it was an economic reason why we didn't get involved. And I looked a little bit deeper and Perkins' name came up. And as I looked, I was like, okay, well, he knew Adams, he knew uh, Webster, he knew Everett. So why, why haven't I heard about this guy before? And come to find out, He's dealing with opium <laughs> and he's get and his supplier is Turkey. <laughs> and so it just seemed, I'm like, this is very interesting. So I had to kind of start back. I'm like, okay, well, what was the part? What was the point where this started? So it took me into the history of the opium trade um, with the West and China. And it led to, really reading about and discovering uh, the McCartney expedition from, uh, from Britain to China and how that China really did not want to change its current arrangement with the West in any way. 
And because of economic strengths, because of all these different revolutions happening around the world, specifically for the British, they just lost uh, a ton of funds uh, into the American Revolution. And now a piece of land that was quite lucrative with a ton of people on it is gone. So now they got to set their sights onto uh, somewhere else. So they look to China. And it was kind of figuring out where all these different narratives came from, figuring out how all these different histories connected. And when I step back, I'm like, this revolution is more of a global event than just a singular regional event because everything kind of affected each other. And if you look at just the history of revolution during that time from 1770 to about Set, uh, to about 1830 and even a little bit beyond, everything that happened in regards to revolution was kind of a global effect. Everywhere kind of was affected in some way, shape, or form by something else happening on the, gro on the ground um, in one location. And so I kind of tried to figure that out narratively and follow, follow okay, so what was Perkins doing at this time period? What was he doing here? What was he doing at that time? What were the Americans doing at that time? And kind of breaking it down and figuring out where all of these different narratives kind of converged, if that makes any sense. Can you give us, uh, I guess, a specific picture and timeline of the events taking place, you know, leading up to in the beginning of the war? Certainly. So, as I said, the, the point that I see as kind of the start of where all this happened was with the Treaty of Paris. Uh, between the United States and the British government, because you had two majorly re uh, uh, resulting things. You had one hand, the British, who wanted money. They needed to get it from somewhere, so they decided to trade with the Chinese. And China, the emperor, didn't want to budge on it, uh, budge on the current situation, because it was a good economic situation for them. They just sold them tea and silk, and they got money in exchange. And to the British, this was a huge deficit for their economy. And they didn't really have anything that was of interest to the Chinese. Um, another problem that was involved there was how diplomacy was done in the East versus the West. Uh, in the West, when you approached another country, even if you were at war with them, it was always you approached them on an equal level and said, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to deal um, equally on the on these terms but in the far east um, especially with china they had a tributary system that had been in place for centuries their view of the world is this idea of the mandate of heaven where the emperor is the most virtuous person in the planet that's why he's the emperor and the center of civilization rests with the emperor and everything outward emanates from him so if a barbarian, and they use barbarian quite liberally in their reference to anybody outside of the sphere of China, um, then you're seen as a tributary. You don't talk to the emperor unless you're going to, trib uh, going to bring tribute to him in some way, shape, or form. And so these two different approaches to how diplomacy worked uh, in two different regions of the globe certainly clashed. So the only option that really the English had, um, despite the fact that they were in debt from a war and the East India Company was also in debt because of uh, taking over India. Um, they had to wage a war during the same time as the American Revolution to conquer swaths of India. And they were in big financial trouble. And so they turned to the British government and said, we need to get some money somehow, we need help here. So they said, we're gonna now open up official communications with China. And after the meeting and everything, they said, the only product that seems to work that we can get money out of is the opium. And it kind of took off from there. So on the other side of the globe, with the United States leaving this conference, they lost, they gained many things, uh, independence to choose who they want to affiliate with, uh, the ability to have free and open trade. But at the same time, they lost all the benefits that came with being under the protection of the crown. Uh, first, they didn't have the protection of the British Navy. 
the U.S. Navy was very backwater. It was new, it was small, it was a baby nation. It could patrol its waters, kind of, but it couldn't really do anything overseas too far. Um, second, all those countries that they traditionally traded with um, that uh, were only trading with them because they were British citizens. They were a new country and they technically needed to build up the credit with all these different kinds of countries all over the world, including the French, the Spanish, the Ottomans, the Italians, everybody. So they had to go out and say, we're Americans now, we want to build up a, a trade relationship with you. So that was one additional pressure on top of it. And furthermore, the mercantile system had been broken. Um, a good example of what this means, uh, the mercantile system uh, in terms of how it worked in the new world is you got slaves and products from Africa, brought it to the Caribbean, traded it for sugar and other goods, brought it up to the, brought it up to the colonies, exchanged that, turned it into rum, brought it back to Africa or to Britain and continue the cycle um, of that sort of trade. And you had designated ports. Um, now the United States couldn't get to these designated ports from Britain. In fact, the British wouldn't, wouldn't let them. Um, there's one part in Perkins' life when he's first out on the sea um, in the late 1780s where he gets to Java and he comes into the port and they're told, you can't unload your products here yet. You haven't been approved yet. And they waited there a little while. And then, then they finally were able to say, okay, you can trade now. So they were still trying to create this credit and traditional ports were no longer available to them. So they need to re-navigate and how, figure out how their economic situation was going to work. So this leads America off to try and at the trying to trade as well, and trying to trade in the Mediterranean. Um, as they started to venture out, they started to encounter issues with piracy because they didn't have the protection of the Navy. So we have the first Barbary Wars. Um, these conflicts, uh, these conflicts made merchants very, very weary because not only were your ships being raided, you would be thrown into slavery at the same time. And the United States, because it didn't really have a built-up Navy, just said, we'll pay the ransom at first. Um, so they paid the ransom. And then when Jefferson came along, Jefferson, no, we're not going to pay the ransom. You're going give to give them back to us. And the Barbary pirates declared war on the United States. And so this led to the United States doing its first real naval foreign engagement in uh, foreign waters, and they were victorious and able to secure passage of the sea for that time. The second Barbary War was not because of any direct American actions um, on the Barbary pirates on, on the north coast of Africa. It was actually the British that said, we're at war with them in the 1812. Why don't you continue raiding their ships as they come in? And the Barbary pirates said, okay, we'll do that. And so that caused the second Barbary War. And we were able to win that one. And so, as you can see, the United States was starting to get a little bit more confident with this Navy, but the merchants were still trying to figure out how to find where the money was and make sure, uh, find out where the proper markets was, were and how they can ensure their protection on the seas. So there was quite a bit of money involved and a, a, quite a lot of risk. So this brings us up to about our present time, uh, about to 1820s or so. And at this time, the opium market is starting to pick up. American traders, specifically Thomas Perkins, is uh, getting involved in the opium trade and bringing in quite a substantial income, not just for himself, but the city of Boston um, and the whole entire New England region by extension. Um, and then his main supplier were the Turks uh, and they were starting to get more involved with them. The Turks were starting to recognize the United States as a, as a country and a potential economic partner. And then the Greek war for independence happens. And so this kind of brings us to what your question was of where we are in terms of our historical. There's so many, so many things happening at the same time. 
Oh, yeah. And then I know the French, Napoleon had gone to Egypt, yeah. you know, an unsuccessful trip there. Mm -hmm. And I guess at the time, the French and the, the British are arch enemies, right? Trading oh, enemies. Yeah. And as a lead up to this, we, we had our own, again, the War of 1812. You've had all this. And then I, I wanted to ask you about, because a lot of this had to do with the Monroe Doctrine. And maybe you yes. can, you know, about... We, I, I, we experience it even to this day where we're, you know, we, here, here we are, part, part of the conversation, even the latest, you know, election was these long looming wars in Afghanistan and oh, yeah. that have taken place forever. And Americans by far, I, I guess it's a history of it, don't want to get involved. We want to just, you know, stay yeah. in our, stay in our own sort of a, a corner of the world and take care of our own problems. So can you talk about the Monroe Doctrine and what led up to I mean, you described some of the forces that led up to that, but how yeah. it all ties in with that, the official sort of pronouncement. Yeah, and well, where it ties into the Monroe Doctrine is you have both the policy and the traditional narrative of uh, that part of history, where um, America going out uh, and trying its hand at all these different ports and these different diplomatic situations, they kept on getting burned because they weren't just getting raided by the Barbary pirates. They were, their sailors were getting impressed. Um, they were being captured mostly by the British, but the French too, uh, and thrown into forced service upon the ships. Uh, and that's what led to, world, uh, to the War of 1812. And it still technically wasn't resolved after it. They were still getting sailors and impressed. It happened less and less as time went on, but still it wasn't fully resolved. And so the United States, as a result on the official policy dealing with this immediate situation was that, hey, we're going to keep out of that side of the globe and everything in the Western Hemisphere is under our jurisdiction. And the fine points say, we recognize all of those countries down there that have declared independence um, and we are happy about their independence. However, if they're still under the Spanish crown, we're not going to get involved. So it was kind of a commitment, not a commitment at all. And at the same time, they were saying, well, and then we're also policing the waters there too. We're there to defend them as well, which was a non-threat because the U.S. Navy wasn't that powerful. Um, I mean, they were powerful. They, I think if you had to put a, put a modern day equivalence to them, they're like Ni a modern day country of Nigeria. It's certainly a regional power, had qu has quite a bit of influence. They, can, they have a good world standing with the big countries in the world, but they're still not the strongest kid on the block. And the United States saying that the Western Hemisphere is under our domain is quite a statement, <laughs> to put it lightly. And really the ones who were kind of protecting all these countries down in the down in South America and Latin America that were declaring independence were the British. And the reason why the British were doing that is because there was a great chance for them to get in on trade, specifically silver, silver uh, mines that were down there. And if they could get their access to that, then they'd have tons of money being able to come in. They could open up these markets, an entire continent and a half of markets that they weren't able to touch because of the mercantile system for years and years and years. Um, so, and the other part of this is that this is our area, we're protecting it. And this part of the world that you guys are in, we won't interfere too, which is where Greece comes into this, yeah. comes into the equation of saying that we're not going to get involved over there, but at the same time, we're still going to be trading. And I, I noticed Jared, that I noticed, you know, in doing my own research on your research and your wonderful research, there were, you know, there were no, there was no CNN or, or TV stations. Oh, yeah. There were no, you just had the press and, mm -hmm. and the press at the time you had fascinating, almost like people magazine type of stories about mm -hmm. captains that escaped, you know, oh, yeah. whether it was Arab pirates and wrote these scathing articles about how horrible they were treated, you know, so there was that human element that caused, I think, a lot of the outrage, yeah. you know, uh, in, in, against the Ottoman Empire too. I mean, they suffered oh, the yeah. brunt, you know, of, of sort of that outrage, and and I think religion had a lot to play with that too. Yeah. One one piece of evidence that I really 
drifted towards um, was a speech by Seri- uh, Dwight, uh, Dwight Edward Serino, or Serino Edward Dwight. Sorry, I got the name mixed up, mixed up. But he was a preacher in Boston at the time, and he made a, made a speech uh, not too long after the uh, uh, not too long after the vote for uh, for whether or not the United States would send an actual representative to Greece, essentially recognizing Greece as a country uh, during its war of independence. And he wove this very ideological web of where that this was not just a conflict where we're defending our philosophical heritage and our cultural heritage and people who have in essence adopted our revolutionary heritage, but it's also an attack on Christendom itself was very much a part of his speech. And he had a very, uh, very, uh, codependent view of how how these ideologies work together he said well because they're christian they're open to the ideas of revolution and liberalism and by extension you know they already have these classical ideas in place so one will follow the other and they saw um, at least in the united states they viewed it as kind of this interdependent sort of thing where part of American civilization um, rested on three legs, that of classicism, liberalism, and Christendom in a certain way. And he viewed it very much as interdependent. And this was so popular. His speech was so popular, it was done twice. What's so amazing is if you go back and think of 45 years prior to the start Mm -hmm. of the Greek revolution was our own revolution here in the United Mm -hmm. States, our own independence. So, you think of that parallelism, you think of what people must have been thinking, people were so probably alive that it's seen the oh, yeah. outcome of our own revolution here in the United States. And uh, they're saying, okay, how do we, you know, how do we help the cause? How do we have that event? Like you said before, you know, it, it wasn't just a regional event, it was a global event. And, yeah. you know, you have people here, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, yeah. uh, who was famously painted in his Evzon outfit, is buried here in uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. So, you know, there's people right here in our backyard that fought there. Oh, yeah. So if you look at, you know, the friend of Hellenic culture, the friend of Hellenic virtues, otherwise known as a philoline, you know, I view and consider you as a philoline because all this research you've done, you're, you're a friend of the culture and all this other uh, things that you've talked about. So specifically, there was something that was talked about as this Greek fire, that happened early on in that, you know, in the 1800s or so, where people could relate, kind of some of the stuff I was saying before, how it was short term between our own revolution here in the United States and what was going on in Greece. Tell us a bit about the, the roots of that Greek fire, understanding how the government played a role in it, how the, the will of the people and, and so forth. So Greek fire, what, you know, what was it and, and how did it come about? There is Edward Everett. Um, so he's, probably the most well-known of the Philhellenes um, uh, during the time. And he really hit the ground running of trying to, trying to gather support for the Greek co- uh, for the Greek uh, war for independence. Uh, he formed the Boston uh, Greek committee. And I think it, it was, if not the first, it was certainly the most well-known of all of them. Um, and he, was good friends with Webster, uh, with Daniel Webster, and many other politicians in the uh, in the Boston circle. Um, and he was quite prolific with a lot of his writings. Um, very, he was a very well educated classicist, a uh, professor professor of uh, I think it was Greek history um, at uh, Harvard for quite for quite a number of years. Uh, so he certainly set the set the organizational uh, foundation for it. Um, in that regard. Uh, so it, it's, he, he's certainly one of the big players and certainly one of the people that uh, Perkins had to keep his eye on during, <laughs> during much of the time. And his, uh, he was one of the movers and shakers that made sure that all those volunteers that we talked about um, made sure that they got the funds. Like the Greek committees initially were set up to uh, not just get arms and munitions, but any Americans that were volunteering to go forth and fight in the Greek conflict, he made sure that they were financed. Uh, he, one letter, one letter specifically uh, that I remember to uh, 
Perkins that he had sent uh, was saying, please, I need money. I'm, I'm almost out of my own funds for this. I'm almost out of my own, own funds in order to support this. I need your help in order to make this continue on. And our people that are fighting over there really need our financial support. Um, so he's certainly one of, one of the big, uh, big supporters of the Phil Hellenic movement and helped organize all sorts of events during the time. And if I may, if I may uh, supplement, he was a, a well-to-do man. Mm -hmm. um, and also political servant. I think he was served in Congress and the Senate, and yep. he was the president of Harvard University. So, I mean, had access to the best of the best in terms of uh, indoctrinating them with this, uh, this sort of spirit. And, and Drake and uh, Questa, let's, let's segue into the meat of, of your, as we talk, we refer to him about Perkins, who mm -hmm. I... I characterize as a George Soros, Koch brothers, Rockefellers, all in one. Just an, an incredible, and I think, and I think actually, uh, you know, the Forbes family, the, the Steve Forbes mm -hmm. family, uh, traces has roots directly to him as well. Oh but yeah, an enigmatic and amazing man by his own right. And there's a book, uh, a seminal book that you, you mentioned to me um, by two scholars called "The Merchant Prince of Boston." which I really think sums up nicely what he was in many ways. He was royalty in many ways, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, he was just, I mean, all these photos here that we have, if you go through, yeah, let's uh, see well, all of the, yeah, all these paintings that we have of Thomas Jefferson, um, they're all done by, most of them are done by Gilbert Stewart. And every single one of the people in these paintings, with probably the exception of George Washington, um, is directly or indirectly connected to uh, Thomas Ber Perkins in one way. Um, and it just shows the fact that all of these prominent people chose to get themselves painted by Gilbert Stewart. Um, and all of these very wealthy and well-to-do people in Boston, in the Boston area itself, chose to get uh, selected by, uh, chose to get painted by, uh, uh, by, uh, by Gilbert Stewart um, shows that they were probably all referred by the same patron. Um, and I mean, there's one story that I remember specifically uh, from, from my research of where uh, uh, Gilbert Stewart was known for taking quite a long time for finishing his paintings of people. And James Perkins, the brother of, Tom, of Thomas Perkins passed away um, and Perkins had commissioned that he make a painting. Um, and three or four weeks into, uh, into when he was supposed to be working on this, uh, Perkins swings by the studio and finds that the painting is just a sketch. And his brother's been passed away for quite some time, for a little bit of time. And he's like, I, I gave you this money a little while ago. Why heck, the heck haven't you finished it? Um, and I forget the exact quote, but it was something to the effect of is that you have essentially messed up so bad. Don't ever expect me to come by again, sort of thing. And a couple of weeks later, you know, Gilbert Stewart just so happens to bump into him on the streets of Boston and, and urges him, oh, come, come to my studio. It, it, uh, I got to show you something. And the whole entire portrait was finished, which just shows, I think, a little bit right there of kind of just how important his word was, at least in the Boston community, um, that he was able to get somebody who's so well known and able to, uh, able to get presidents to sit down for him for a painting, is able to get nervous because he displeased um, one guy who's, in the market, who's a merchant and how influential he was. At the time, you know, in the 1800s, Boston, the city of Boston, um, you know, one of the, one of the major cities in, in the country at the time, uh, one of the original cities, uh, was becoming certainly a, a, a major hub for transportation, manufacturing, um, and a lot of these people like Perkins uh, that were, you know, started institutions uh, here in the Boston area. Obviously, the, Harvard was the first uh, in a university here that they – they all, uh, all the elites were, were trained at, you know, learning in the classics and the arts and so forth. And, you know, there was quite a few 
gentlemen like Perkins who were successful business people, merchants, as we say, as you outlined earlier. And they, um, you know, they had the foresight not only to, to build the city, build the city and, and want a city that thrives, but because of those influences, they also wanted, you know, the city of Boston, as, as we all know it today, as really a thriving area of arts and culture. And so, you know, I know we'll talk a little bit more about some of the institutions that, that eventually developed from Perkins, but, but they also, you know, these, and it goes beyond just, uh, you know, the Perkins family, as we know, you know, the Adams family uh, was, you know, originated here in New England. We, you talked about Daniel Webster, uh, uh, President Coolidge also had roots here. Um, and then plenty of names that, you know, a lot of buildings and cities, Everett is a city named after him. You know, the, the factories and mills up in Lowell, uh, you know, the, a lot of these industrialists back then who really were the, were the driving force behind the, the reputation that Boston had uh, and developed into today were very and highly influential at, at all levels. And certainly, the, you know, as you, as you just noted, they had a, a direct pipeline to, to government. And so let's, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit more about Perkins and, and his life and, and then get to specifically to the, you know, the influences that he had, um, you know, with regards to the, uh, you know, the, the Greek independence war and, and how we, you know, the whole Monroe Doctrine and the, the influences behind, uh, you know, keeping the U.S. out of it. Um, it's quite a, fa- quite a fascinating time period of all just so many crises that a young baby nation, young baby republic was trying to get through. Um, and it's quite fascinating. <laughs> One of the reasons I love history is you see just all these struggles of real human flaws coming through, coming through trying to deal with issues in the time and trying to work with each other, especially when things are so new. For them, it was new. They were this new thing that hadn't been done in over 1,500 years. So tell us a little bit. You know, they were merchants in, in, in tea trading and furs. Uh, you mentioned opium as well as, as really opening up the door to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the wealth of, of the, these traders back then. So tell us a little bit the, the evolution of uh, Colonel sure. Perkins. Certainly. So the one thing that is notable that you can kind of use Perkins as a good case model is he really kind of represents this evolution of um, American merchants during this time period um, between the American Revolution and the Greek War for Independence. He started off as somebody invested into the uh, trade in the Indies. In order to try a new venture, he had an opportunity to try his luck out in Canton. Um, And so they figured, okay, let's load up a ship, um, of all these different local products we have, um, one of them I think was ginseng that they loaded into there, and they said, "Let's see how it sells." So they sail uh, right around the same time as the Constitution was being made. So from 1788, I think it was to about 1791 that he was out at sea, or 1790 that he was out at sea, um, and they go all the way to Canton, and he lives there for a little bit of a time learning the market, um, understanding how the trade trade works. And then he discovers that the products that he, he's brought are not as lucrative as he thought they were going to be. Specifically, the ginseng didn't really sell as well as you thought it was going to be because another American merchant came in there and it drove down the price. So he knew how prices worked and fluctuated over there because he was on the ground to see it. He saw that when you introduced a product that was common, the price would go down and all of a sudden your, your return is going to be small. If you bring something that's of high demand and you bring it into the area, then you're, then it's going to be a high return for you. So he sees this and he notices that fur is a, is a potential product that he can invest in. So he eventually commissions another ship to try the fur trade. And this time he's doing it from Boston. So they go down they pick up furs from the coast, uh, from, the north, from the northwest, and then he starts getting a decent profit from it. And he starts incorporating not just local business partners. The first business partner that he had was the, was McGee, the McGee family. Uh, William McGee, I think it was, um, was out of Providence. And he started with this fur trade. The next step that he came on to is he had actually a relative um, that 
uh, a cousin that was actually a loyalist during the American Revolution. Uh, I think it was George Hop- George Perkins that was stationed in uh, Smyr- Smyrna in uh, in Turkey, and over there he is able to set up shop over there and start creating trade with the uh, Ottoman Ottoman Empire and is able to bring in products from there and starting to introduce opium into his trade network. Jared, if I may, if I may Go ahead. Uh, these are mavericks, right? Because, I mean, they're in Canada. I mean, they're opening up offices. They're living there. Oh, yeah. I mean, so not a lot of people are doing that, right? Oh, yeah. And he's bringing in all the people who are friends with him, too, friends and family. Um, I mean, the, his main guy, on the gr- main guy on the ground that he depended on the most, uh, especially in Canton, um, was his adopted, uh, his adopted son, who was his nephew, uh, John Perkins Cushing. And he ends up building, building it up with him, and he's kind of sharing. He says, okay, now I'm going to bring my son-in-law into it, Samuel Cabot Jr., he also brings in his own direct son, Thomas Jr., into helping captaining some of the ships. Um, and you just go down the list of all these people that were involved were either business, close business associates and friends of his, yeah, or they were direct family members, or he married them into his family. And, and they're bringing, I, I can explain this to me, they're bringing tremendous amounts of cash oh. at the time, right? Specie. Oh, yeah. How did that work? And why were they doing that? I mean, they were bringing gold, co- their gold coins, I guess, right? Silver and gold yeah. coins. Yeah, because it's the only thing the Chinese were interested in. Everything else, that was the big problem that, um, that they were encountering as they were starting this, starting this off, uh, starting the trade off. Um, the Chinese were only really interested in getting the silver and gold from the from the west and that's also one of the reasons that drove the british into the opium trade because they didn't have big silver deposits they had silver but the true silver uh, deposits were all in latin america and they were really trying to get their hands on latin american commerce that's part of why they were helping these independence movements happen along so they could maybe get some money from there to continue this addiction that they have to tea at the time. Um, and so the United States, uh, all these people from the United States were dealing with similar it- issues of what can I sell to them without it being gold and uh, silver because it depreciates and you have to kind of, uh, everything fluctuates so much. Um, one minute, as you can see, uh, see from the book um, about his life that one minute the furs are super profitable but after the War of 1812, they started going down. They weren't really that profitable anymore. And so he starts realizing that, huh, the one thing I can sell that's really getting a lot of money is this opium. The British are doing it over there. We can't go to India but because that's controlled by the British. But what if we go to Turkey? I have a cousin over there in Turkey. Maybe, maybe he can help me. So he starts building up his network there starts establishing a line and when he starts bringing in these all this uh all this stuff that's being brought in illegally by the way and having to literally drop it off and in boats that are passing by (laughs) of bundles of of opium to people in boats going by (laughs) dropping it in their boat and then throwing up the cash because they can't do it in the harbor um that he sees that there's oh there's a lot of money that can be made from this and the first time where he really starts to focus on that opium amount, about the money that you can get from opium, uh, his first one that was primarily opium in 1817, 1818, he brought back half a million dollars of profit off the top of everything that came back. And that included not just the opium, but the other products that they sold. And so, and that's all the tea and stuff that they put into there, and then they sold it into, the, into Boston as well as any species that they col- collected from uh, the cell of direct opium as well. So it was quite a bit of money there. And he says, Ooh, well, then let's go full in on this. So over the next couple of years, he switches most of his product line to just being opium. And he's dragging in about a million, a million dollars every year. It shows how, how profitable this is, was because one, it was a legal product. 
and it's always going to be in high demand and you can name your price for it. And so, I, I mean, for him, it was a lot of money coming in that really built up a lot of his businesses and it built up a lot of his network, his trade network. Uh, and the added part of it too, is he was able to bring in tea, um, silk and other products much more into the Boston area because of that. And he was able to also realize too, and one of the sources I read that this specific type of opium that came from Turkey was a niche product and had, there were people who preferred it over the Indian opium. So on top of that, he also could market it as a little bit of a niche product and kind of name his own price a little bit. As at the time, um, the Ottoman Empire was still deciding as to whether or not they want to give the United States full access to trade. You have the Greek War for Independence come along. And if the United States, even if the United States had said, oh, well, uh, we're just going to recognize Greece as a country that could jeopardize this whole entire operation. They would just shut, they would just shut it down right there on the ground. So he was worried about that and it really affected mostly him and all of his family and his business par partners within his immediate orbit. Um, he wasn't probably, he probably was more than likely he was not the only one. Um, I'm sure if you dig deep enough into other influential people, not just in Boston, but in New York um, and Philadelphia and up and down the United States at the time, you probably would find people who had vested interested interests in Turkey in some way, shape, or form. You said the U.S. Constitution, otherwise known as uh, Old Ironsides. Uh, she's yep. docked here at, in, at Charlestown. And uh, very few people know this, but one of the revered uh, uh, war heroes, General Fodor Korokotroni, was actually on Old Ironsides. Oh, wow. <laughs> when she was out uh, in Greece during the 1800s. Uh, so... I think he was one of one or two other war heroes who were actually on her. So uh, I'm going to digress a bit, but we're very excited. Next Thursday, we're actually going to have a, a flag raising on, uh, on uh, the Constitution, uh, the Greek flag, uh, to do that. So we're very excited. But, you know, when you hear, again, it's recent history, right? I mean, the fact that one of the foremost war heroes was on Old Ironsides is, is mm -hmm. mind-boggling. But uh, just bringing it back to... Uh, to, to Perkins here, you know, as, as we say in Boston, he was definitely a wicked smack, as we oh. say up here. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of the things that, you know, look, I think we've all been in, in politics conversations the past couple of months and years, so I want to I want to inject some uh, some politics here. So Perkins, from what I read and, and what you wrote there, was actually ahead or headed the first uh, political party in the United States, otherwise known as the Federalists, where obviously, you know, they want the they wanted close relations with Great Britain and, and all this other stuff. So tell us about his political ambitions, what he did in politics. And, and you know, again, it was a short-term period, but tell us a little bit about his uh, jaunt into politics. Oh, he was, he was, uh, he was basically a kingmaker in, in Massachusetts. Um, in terms of political games, um, I mean, he was, back in the 1800s, um, in the 1700s, they had a position called, I think it was Vote Counter, or the vote, vote monitor, and that was his job, where he would, the ballots back then were color-coded, and it was not a secret ballot. So he could subtly influence um, the way in which people voted. So then say, oh, well, that guy's supposed to be getting the pink slip, not the, not the green slip for this candidate. <laughs> and the same tactic was used all the way up through the Industrial Revolution. You see the same thing uh, being called for during the early progressive era of people saying to get rid of get rid of the public ballot do the secret ballot so we don't have to don't have to do this but his job was the guy to be to be there and see the votes being cast in there and see who was voting for whom um, the other thing he was on the central federalist central committee uh, which set up uh, the set uh, which helped set up the uh, political uh, kind of uh, districts in the state of Massachusetts at the time, or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I should say, is more accurate. Um, and as a result of that, he just had a lot of influence. He knew how to put people into power by just saying the right word. I mean, a great example that it's not just a demonstration of his strength, but of how uh, his strength politically 
uh, but who he had it over was in 1808, uh, John Quincy Adams um, said something uh, to the effect where he was agreeing with Jefferson's embargo at the time. Now, Perkins hated the embargo because, embargo because this stopped his entire business model. He couldn't send ships out properly in order to get, uh, get fur products and sell them in Canton because he was being blockaded, being attacked by... <laughs> by British and French vessels. Um, so it was not safe. And he was kind of sitting there hoping that his investments weren't going to go go belly up over across seas until this thing was over. And he, you know, he perceived John, Adam, uh, John Quincy Adams, although uh, a Federalist at the time, uh, agreeing with Thomas Jefferson about this, he, he took that personally. He took that as a like, well. If you're going to disagree with us and attend a Democratic Republican, Democratic Republican meeting, which is what he did, then I'm going to make sure that state seat that you run for, you're not going to get it. And he was able to throw in a dark horse candidate um, for the position that John Quincy Adam was running for. And this guy who nobody knew was able to get elected and John Quincy Adams lost the race. Um, and there was even the influence that he had over John Quincy Adams at the time was so absolute that there was a letter, I think from Rufus King, I think it was, I might be wrong, uh, but he was from New York, um, said that he saw that, ha that he even kind of shunned uh, uh, John Quincy Adams in public bars uh, to where John Quincy Adams would, would enter the bar and people would ignore him. Because of that, just how influential Perkins and the Federalist kind of infrastructure was was put together, um, he also had a lot of political allies. One one of his best friends uh, that he had was Harrison Otis, uh, who served as a U.S. senator and congressman, um, and he was very close friends with him. Um, and they were both ardent Federalists that believed very much the same thing. And they supported each other through thick and thin, so much so that during the War of 1812, um, Perkins was actually a part of the Blue Light Federalists that wanted to cede New England from the Union um, because they didn't like the fact that they couldn't trade right then <laughs> and didn't like the fact that they couldn't be the making the decisions about diplomacy and how the United States should be, uh, should be uh, trading. And Harrison Otis... And him were one of were two of the delegates that actually were traveling to Washington D.C. to deliver the papers on secession <laughs> to Washington D.C. And then when they got there, they ran into the parade with Andrew Jackson coming back from New Orleans. And so then all of the wind was blown out. <laughs> wind was blown out of their sails at that point. Uh, but in terms of his uh, political abilities, I mean, it was quite impressive. There's tons of instances from his letters, from public, le uh, from newspaper articles. Uh, for example, the uh, newspaper that he would constantly write to as a merchant, um, especially in the 1820s, all he would have to do is write an article bashing somebody in it anonymously, but they knew who he was. Um, and that person wouldn't wouldn't get what they wanted, or they would he would be able to change the change the minds of several people. I mean, it's arguable to say that he probably scuttled quite a bit of uh, uh, John Quincy Adams support in 1828 for his reelection, uh, because initially in 1827, uh, Perkins sat down with uh, well had a letter, uh, was corresponding with Quincy Adams. And Quincy Adams sent him a letter saying, thank you so much for working with me on this. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, getting me in connection with Israel Thorndike to explore this business venture. I love to, you know, thank you for having past business with you. So he was probably doing business while he was president, which is what you're not supposed to do <laughs> during that time. And he was thanking him for his support and his financial support and his ability to help him with the future campaign coming along. Well, he had said, apparently Adams had published something in the paper criticizing the Federalist Party. And then, you know, 
Perkins just puts something in the newspaper as a merchant and kind of scuttles his campaign, criticizing him about it. So it was kind of fascinating just how much, how much of a grip on power and how much influence he had in the political sphere. I could go on and on about all the different little instances of subtle political power and where he was kind of stationed. Um, I'm, I remember one kind of controversial tale was the Selfridge incident of a guy who was a Federalist who had murdered uh, a Democratic Republican in a bar. And this guy got off and it was pled as self-defense. Um, and one of the people that was on the jury box was John Perkins. Um, <laughs> so if they knew each other, <laughs> so it's just kind of a little bit of uh, astounding just how much influence he kind of had. It, it, seem, it seems, Jared, that it was, you know, almost I, I've read, I mean, this fellow was, had mining interests and he's, oh, selling, yeah. he's selling cannonballs, he's selling military stuff. Oh, yeah. The military, hotels, theaters, commodities. We said furs, tees. And then meanwhile, he's building these ships. These are his own ships going overseas. Yeah. So he's keeping shipyard after shipyard active. So almost too big to fail. And what I find interesting is that at the time, um, you know, through, through, I guess, the lobby, I mean, you, could read, you have to read between the lines sometimes because you, oh, yeah. you can find a lot of correspondence, but not everything. Oh, but yeah. President Monroe has his own sort of spy, mm -hmm. Bethune English, I think that was his name. Yeah, um, George Bethune English. Right. Yeah. Who's, who, what, and so while Everett, Everett and Bethune are classmates from Harvard, right, and good yeah. friends, and while, while Everett's sort of leading the charge amongst the grassroots, let's help Greece, Bethune's trying to do a long-term deal with the Ottomans, right? Like a, yeah. To get to be able to access the Bosporus and to access those areas, so just crazy, crazy about how about the influence. Well, and I, and I love I love the little story of him being on the ship with the other guy that was going to go to Greece. That's from New Hampshire. Um, <laughs> he's on the same boat going out to going out to uh, Greece and the Ottomans as well. And it was kind of an awkward situation because you can see. The one thing that I, kind of fascinated me was just how Monroe was so conflicted. He really wanted to help the Greeks, and he sent somebody on the same ship coming out of coming out of Virginia Beach um, with Bethune, uh, with with with, uh, with George Bethune English, and this guy who's not an official representative of the United States, but he's going on the United States' behalf, and he's going to be supported by the local Greeks. And they decide to put him on the same ship and send him off <laughs> to the same location. So, to what extent do you think it, it seems like, because you know, like, I guess, it, it, let's say something happens in Smyrna. Mm -hmm. By the time you hear about it in Boston, it's going to take three months, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, at best. Okay. At I mean, best. Even if you, po you, know, you take your Wells Fargo pony to, to, to England somehow. Oh, yeah. It's still going to take a long time. So news is not going back and forth quickly. So it seems like you have to appease and not, you know, like you said, because if they're not going to sell to the Americans, they're going to sell to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So officially you have to appease them, but I guess they let the gra they were supporting the sort of grassroots effort. It, 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 you think that's accurate? Yeah. I mean, uh, in terms of the politicians on, on the national stage, uh, I mean, to be honest, I think that – if they didn't have all these conflicting interests, I mean, they would have probably gone with the vote on it. I mean, you don't have the two most prominent congressmen stand up and give some of the most impassioned speeches about defending Greece, going and supporting these people who have uh, supported us for, uh, you know, uh, who have given us this philosophical foundation in our own culture, who are trying to fight for freedom like we are. Um, and then all of a sudden, after a week of debate, you decide to have a tabling vote where it's completely unanimous of 135 to zip to just table the, table the notion. And there's no further resistance from, uh, from, Cl from Henry Clay or even uh, Daniel Webster, who just gave the speech of the century, <laughs> uh, defending, defending this. And... 
I think that there was a genuine, from what I can tell, there was a genuine interest in, in helping these people out. Um, genuine interest in really trying to support the, the Hellenes, but there was, uh, for me, reading the Monroe Doctrine just looks like there's just so many hands on the steering wheel, to be honest. I mean, why would you put out a document that's so, we're supporting them and then we're not supporting them and we're going to stay out of here and you stay out of here and making, you know, statements that have no actual, actual ganas. It seems like it's honestly so many hands at the wheel that they don't know what to do with the situation. It seemed like um, there I'm certain that personally, Daniel Webster uh, and uh, Henry Clay certainly wanted to do something to get something federally done. And you even have state and state and local legislatures. Uh, Poughkeepsie stands stands out to mind of them passing local bills, urging the federal government to do something, and then also reserving spaces on ships for cargo to be sent out to to Greece to support to support them and to send more funds. I mean, it's genuine grassroots. And I think that it was a fine line that these politicians did have to walk. On one hand, you have people who are like Perkins, who have such a huge economic influence and benefit uh, to the United States at the time um, that are saying, you know, don't do this. Don't, don't give them support. And then you have at the same time, all of the other people on the ground who really want to do something about this. Uh, I feel that they had to walk that fine line because if they went out and just said, we're not supporting them at all and didn't show any sort of support or even recognition of the Greek effort, it would be seen as not just a, an attack on the, uh, a disregard of the philosophy of the foundation of the United States. Um, but also to their minds, uh, an attack on Christendom itself yeah. in a lot of ways. We're going to shift gears as we conclude real quick. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give it to Drake, but um, to focus on where, where Wright did make rule over might and mm -hmm. was sort of the impact that the Greek War of Independence had mm -hmm. here in America. Drake, do you want to pick yeah, up? No, and, and to, yeah, and to carry on what you just said, Jared, um, you know, because of that, such strong influences um, of of uh, the founding fathers from ancient Greece and learning the Greek culture and the language, uh, and really the, the the personal struggles they all had uh, during the war and, and trying trying to stay neutral, I guess in in uh, in the public sphere, but behind the scenes doing what they can. And a lot of what came out of this too is you know talk to us a little bit about um, you know the impact of the war. Uh, and the, the influences it had on the abolitionist movement, as well as women's rights. Yeah, well, I mean, as we had brought up a little bit earlier, the uh, captivity stories were certainly something that resonated with people of, of slavery really affecting uh, people, you know, people who don't normally see themselves in that light of slavery, of seeing them potentially being put into a situation where they're forced to work and live, live in horrible conditions um, is one thing that certainly emerged out of it, of people saying that these, these Ottomans are coming along, they're taking our ships, they, and they're attacking all of these, uh, uh, the Greek people and enslaving their women and killing the men and, and the whole bit and seeing just how horrible that this was of people being put into, into such horrible conditions. Uh, and the one appeal that they certainly hit upon um, was the appeal to uh, appeal to women of seeing, saying that, you know, the aid that we're going to switch from is not to arms anymore. We're going to switch over to uh, education uh, support, money for education, uh, clothing and food that we're going to send over there. And, that the latter part of the conflict, um, most of the funds uh, came came in that form. A lot of a lot of the funds ended up coming into that uh, coming into that form towards the end, and a lot of women's groups kind of built up a built up around it. Um, and you had what's what's his name? <laughs> um, 
you had big names that were kind of involved as well that started the abolitionist movement. And it's kind of fascinating to see how that kind of took off with, uh, you have this infrastructure in place of people seeing it as a religious duty as well of, of uh, Muslims attacking the, the Christian world. And then also seeing it as a humanitarian, um, a humanitarian at the same time. And that was transferable very much. So to a lot of the people in the Northern States and the cities where a lot of these fundraising up fundraising uh, activities happen. Not saying it didn't happen in the South, but because of the geography, because of the population density, it happened far more often. So you had an infrastructure starting to get laid into place for the uh, for this movement, which I find is quite fascinating, and it eventually led to abolitionist groups kind of taking off. Because I mean, it's 1830 is kind of the cutoff date of the support. Uh, of of support for the war, even though more support was was sent after that, um, but it's not too many years later that you really start having the abolitionist movement starting to pick up. Only ten years later, so the infrastructure and the memory is already in place. In the for the audience, our, our last uh, speaker on the subject, Dr. Maureen uh, Connor Santelli, and her wonderful book Greek Fire sort of points this out. But we're looking at. Uh, one of five uh, uh, sculptures, the one below on the left there, that's actually at the National Gallery here in Washington, mm-hmm. called The Greek Slave, and it depicts, and again, this would be, have been scandalous, you know, in, in the 1800s, uh, mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, it depicts a Greek girl, a young Greek girl on the auction block, chained, and you can't see it really, but she's got a cross to her side. And mm-hmm. then finally, you're seeing, you know, uh, it caused outrage. And finally, you know, and this wasn't planned, but you're seeing an introspective look. And you had, you know, abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and so many others saying, wait, yes, we support, you know, freedom of the Greek people and, and, and this uh, stopping the subjugation of women. And now you look at the, the, the uh, this was in Punch magazine in England mm-hmm. that depicts, you know, uh, it's a takeoff of, of the Greek slave showing the Virginia slave on the auction block in manacles, nude, mm. you know, with, with what's, what's in Latin below, you know, our, our motto, el pluribus unum, you know, a freedom for all. So um, I think this was uh, one of the welcomed uh, uh, impacts uh, of the Greek fire movement. And, and, and I asked this to our speaker beforehand, I wonder if we had not had, if we did have, official support, whether this type of discussion and dialogue that directly led up to the Civil War would have happened. And again, it's one of those, and our historian wisely said that's one of the, <laughs> the what ifs in history are great, you know, to pose what would have happened if we did this or that. So, so it's interesting, though, the role of art and the impact of art and what happened. Oh, yeah. 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 Art is the most, one of the most powerful symbols if it's done just right. Um, and just to, to carry on that point out, you know, this wasn't, you mentioned earlier, you know, there was, there was no communication back in the day, right? There was no, uh, you know, it took weeks and months to, to get news. And, and, you know, these are, this, this wasn't, uh, you know, people from Greece, you know, pleading in the U.S. to intervene or help. These were, you know, the, let's not forget the U.S. Navy was there. Uh, uh, playing there, there was no Greek role, community, but, right, Drake? There was no Greek community, right? right. <laughs> None, <laughs> exactly. But the U.S. Navy was was in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean, playing a, a peacekeeper role, keeping eye on obviously its own merchant ships that were still doing business. Um, and they they saw the atrocity atrocities firsthand. And it, so, it, and of course, the Philhellenes that did go over there to fight, they you know this is this is firsthand knowledge. So, so that's again, I think really. It wasn't just word of mouth. They saw everything firsthand, and, and they brought those memories back here, and, and which led to, uh, you know, the discussion beyond that, and merely making it policy and education. Well, mm-hmm. p- part of the paradox, and let's conclude on this sort of note, and especially with our two Bostonians here, three actually New Englanders, right? Is some of the positive things that 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 this man had done, and the legacy that lingers on, and and you know, Drake can talk a little bit. Drake and his family are, are direct benefactors of the. Uh, 
Museum of Fine Arts, the incredible Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Greek and Roman art wing, which I think had its start at the Athenaeum, right, Drake? Which the Perkins, That's, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, when you think back, um, you know, we talked about the, the merchant trading and it, it also related to the, the significant uh, uh a mass of wealth uh, and, and businesses and ownership of properties here across New England. And, um, you know, the, the, that resulted in, in obviously being a factor in a lot of different industries and a lot of different organizations. And, you know, Perkins, I think the most prominent still, still to this day is, is the Perkins School for the Blind, which, uh, you know, actually, again, tying this all together, you know, of course, I mentioned Samuel Howell, who was a great Phil and lean. Samuel Howell brought back with him uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Anagnos, who became his assistant. And fast forward, you know, Perkins donated uh, his mansion to at the time, which was the, the School of Blind Asylum for the School of Blind, it was called. And how was, uh, you know, one of the, one of the originals uh, involved with, with the founding of that. And Anagnos ended up being one of the executive directors. And so, so Perkins started that. He, you know, he was in mining. He was in quarries. Uh, a lot of the, the, the stones that came from his quarries were some of the, uh, you know, monuments to stand to this day, like the Bunker Hill Monument. Uh, he was intricately involved with what, the first major hospital, the Mass General Hospital System, which still is, is the, here today. The Museum of Fine Arts, he was involved in that, uh, which was an outgrowth of the, at the time of the, the Literary Society, the Boston Athenaeum Group. And that, that building still stands today and has some of the, the, the richest art collection and libraries, one of the oldest in the country. So, uh, and there's many more. I mean, and it wasn't just Perkins. Of course, Perkins was the driving force behind it, but, but he and the, the elites with him uh, really created the landscape uh, that we've, we see today and, and why Boston is such a vibrant educational medical hub and, and uh, uh, arts and cultural hub, uh, not only in this country, but in the world. And it's attributed to, to you know, a lot to Perkins. Mm -hmm. Opium. <laughs> the house that opium built. Right? So it was about opium. <laughs> Gustaki, any closing uh, thoughts? No, I just, I, I just love the the whole affinity, right? The Western world has been, you know, romantically connected to Greece for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, old uh, to, and to modern times. So I just love that that affinity, and I just, you know, it, you hear all these stories, and you learn something every single. Time and that's why, uh, you know, Jared. I, I enjoyed so much this evening, and I enjoyed so much listening to what you're saying. And obviously, I reserve the closing comments for Art. But what, what a great topic! What extensive research, and it, it just uh, further tells us that there's so much more to learn. And uh, you know, we're always looking to understand more. And you know, as as uh, as Herodotus said, great deeds are usually wrought at great risks. So oh, yeah. we're always looking to learn more. And, and history is, is a great example. Yeah. Classical and studies. That, are just wonderful to understand and learn more. Oh yeah. yeah, and just to add to the kind of the uh, you know the, the whole adventure of how tying this all together and how complicated it is you think about it, right? He 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 earned a lot of his money from Turkey, right? But but all these buildings were were not built after <laughs> Turkish architects. They're all built. They're all influenced by Greek and Roman art, Greek art, of course. And so it's fascinating that the, you know that that at the end of the day, right? There was mm -hmm. the, the moral obligation. The you know the 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 sympathy behind what was happening, uh, deep you know uh, pressure and stress uh, within everybody at the time uh, to make the right decision. But that was the offset was you're a young country. Mm -hmm. This is a thriving thriving uh, merchant business and economy. You know how can we balance both? But I think to Art's point and to Gus's point, at the end of the day. Once the, you know the, the war was settled and, and Greece moved on to its freedom and, and, and uh, evolution of a country, that you see what happened in this country and how we went through uh, learning from that. So it, it may have been you know a, a uh, you know a black guy to the U.S. at the time uh, that they didn't help really help support Greece economically and politi politically, but just as they did influencing the founding fathers uh, back in the 1700s, Greece continued to influence the United States uh, beyond that. And we're thankful for that. You know, and again, for, uh, borrowing from our last speaker's research, who did copious research, and I think she did, she did Jared, um, 
the, the I forgot the gentleman's name, but he was the founding, the founder of basically Bank of America, who was the secretary, I think, of the Boston Greek Committee. And, you, you know, as an accountant or whatever, he kept copious notes, you know, and recorded everything. And a lot of that research, you might have even run into it since, since your research took you to Harvard, were the actual invoices, or not the receipts, of monies received. And you see, you know, it's like St. Jude's, right? Like five little $5 checks and a dollar, when five bucks was a lot of money back then. Oh, yeah. But from little from people everywhere in all walks of life, even from the Deep South, you know, sort of sending their checks in. So I go back to uh, right over might eventually wins out. You know, and the and and uh, um, any concluding remarks uh, uh, from you or concluding thoughts? Oh uh, well, I certainly loved love to do the research on this. And the only thing, well, I I did finish uh, finish reading Santelli's book uh, the other day, and I was like, boy. I really wish that this was, <laughs> was around when I was doing this. It would have, it, it had, because all the research I had to do of running around and find, find it, I had to go to Harvard. I had to go to the uh, Massachusetts Historical Society. I had to call up documents all the way from, from New York, upstate New York. Um, it just kind of took me everywhere. Uh, and it's really, it's just fascinating how much of a global history that this is that, we it's we tend to think of history as oh Greek and American and British and really it's just so connected when you start seeing how everything works together um, and how following the money for lack of a better term kind of shows you just how everything is so interconnected uh, and how change happens in the world, uh, how change happens in the world just all of a sudden, so suddenly. Uh, and for me, it opened my eyes in terms of studying that time period. It was really not just a revolution of liberties uh, of people around the world uh, in Greece and in America and France uh, and Haiti, but it was really an, an economic revolution in a way. I mean, the, the, the chains of the mercantile uh, economy were gone and capitalist economy took over in a lot of ways uh, where people could go out and have free trade. But at the same time, you had so many other atrocities committed at the same time with, with opium and slavery still continuing on. Um, and it's just quite fascinating when you really get into the details. Um, one of the things that draws me to the history of Greece just in general, is just so how widespread the culture is um, and how much of an effect it has had on the world for not just the Western world, but the Eastern world as well. Um, all the way back in ancient times with the Indo-Greek civilization and the Bactrio, Bactrian Greek civilization, um, the, uh, uh, the Kushan Empire that used Greek as its administrative language um, in the middle of central India um, and just how effective it was all the way to the 1800s and today of them just having such an impact and being a part of world history. So I know it's kind of a long-winded comment. Well, no, but it's great. Well, on behalf of uh, the Alpha Omega Society, the National Hellenic Society, I speak for the three of us. I all know that one of us, all of us, probably waved those little Greek flags on Greek Independence Day and wore our little Evzone suits and didn't know what the hell we were doing, right, or talking about, other than we got to do this and I don't want to wear a skirt. <laughs> but, but certainly you've edified us and taught us a lot about how, you know, how important and relevant what we did and all the kids do. It's very, it's very March 25th, what, what, what they'll be doing around Sunday at church, mm -hmm. about how important it was. It provided that nexus. And for that, we thank you and so many other historians for your work, um, um, for contributing to our education and, and uh, edifying our audience as well. So thank you. And we hope to do more of this uh, in the future. And welcome to, to, to being part of the NHS. Art Gosta and Art, uh, this has been a great uh chat today and uh i think there's no doubt we all like we, we like costa said earlier we're, we're constantly learning it's fascinating uh to learn uh how uh folks here in the boston area 
were major influences, uh, not only in the creation of the city, but in the, in the uh, establishment of, uh, of the neutrality in the war, but also what happened beyond the war and, the, and how the influences continued. So again, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us.